All right, friends, how's it going? Zig coming in at the top of the interview. Today, I have with me the one and only Kevin Eastman, co-creator of... Yep, you heard that right. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And as a kid who grew up on that cartoon and on those toys, this was an epic opportunity to get to talk to a real DIYer. The Ninja Turtles were all self-funded. Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird came up with this idea of a comic joking around one night based on other comic tropes and some of their own creations, and they enjoyed it so much that they self-published the first issue. Their story brings me to a concept I read from Mary Oliver, that emotional freedom comes from only the patient, the diligent, as well as those who are inspired. So being inspired by what's going around and interpreting it in your own way can only lead to emotional freedom. This also got me thinking about the similarities between the comic scene and the music scene, and about how it's not necessarily the venue, the content, or the draw, but how it's more about who you're doing the thing with. Who's at the gig with you? Who's on stage with you? Who recommends the read? How do they know this is going to resonate with you? And that only comes through developing friendships and relationships by stuff you enjoy. If it's music or if it's stories, it's this thing that unites us. And I wanted to take a minute here to talk about some local shops and some relationships me and my friends have developed by going to those shops. First one being Ground Zero, which used to be next to McCarthy's in Strongsville. Um, still is in Strongsville, down the street. Um, Sensei George, for me and Cody, Coda and I, uh, he used to host this mic night right next to it, so we would always go in there. But even before that, when I was in middle school, I would go in there, and this is before I knew how the internet worked, and if I wanted to find something, I could just look it up on the internet. I thought it had to be in a store, or else there was no way to get it, and I was always on the hunt for Trigun action figures. And I would go to all the comic shops and nothing, they would never have it. And I would go there like every three months and looking for uh, these Trigun action figures. And one day the guy, the owner of the shop comes out and it's like, I found this and thought of you and held on to it and missing some of the pieces It's on the house and just gave me this action figure. And that meant so much, you know, just as a kid to be like, well, this guy thought of me. And another shout out is going to be to Comics Are Go, our friends Ed and um, Eric run that shop and it's the only shop that's been selling uh sea levels latest cd burn your own gasoline also available on all streaming platforms and a little self plug hole here um sea levels 10th anniversary show we're doing a special two night benefit november 13th and 14th at the grog shop on the 13th and november uh 14th at the beachland ballroom it's a benefit show so it goes to keep those venues open 100 percent. we got a bunch of friends coming up with us i believe there's still some tickets left for the 14th if you guys are inter- interested in that c-level facebook.com or c-level 44.com for a link to get to those tickets back to comics are go so ed from comics are go did the coolest thing ever for Coda's sister. Coda and his sister go there every week to pick up comics, and on her birthday, they got her this cake with, like, the custom candle that with the right age, you know what I mean? Not the, like, uh, once you get to past 10, you don't want all that fire on a piece of uh, cake, you get the one thing. And they gave her a gift card for the store, and it's just little things like that that go a long way. And that doesn't happen, like, when you go to, like, Walmart or Target. Maybe, you know, maybe, like, your get-go card from Giant Eagle. I don't know if you guys are listening here, I have a Giant Eagle. But it, you, maybe like on your birthday you get a bonus point or whatever, but it, it's computed and doesn't mean anything. When someone goes out of their way that makes something, mean something to their customers, it's a huge thing. So we can't recommend, and I say the we as in me and Coda, cannot recommend Comics Argo or Ground Zero enough, as well as B&L Comics and Parma. Our buddy there has been a, a supporter of Negative Space, and like you guys know, we've been doing all the benefits for that, which is a non-profit art gallery. He comes out to all the jams, so shout out to them too. And we're going to get into it. If you guys can like, rate, review, comment, and subscribe to the podcast on any of the podcast platform, it'd be greatly appreciated. It helps us keep doing this. Um, so here it is, uh, my chat with Kevin Eastman. Hey there, it's Kevin. Hi Kevin, my name's Dave. I'm a host of Zig at the Gig podcast. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, Dave. How are you doing? Absolute pleasure. Awesome, I'm awesome. great. Thank you very much. Um, having, a, having a great day. Hope you're doing the same. Yeah, so far, so good. I mean, uh, it's a pretty exciting moment. Um, I saw that... Uh, what what sorry. part of the country are you in? I'm um, from Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, sweet. Awesome. Well, 
We're in San Diego, so uh, uh, great to be chatting with you again. <laughs> likewise, likewise. So I know I, um, you've been doing press all day, so I got a little bit of time, and I'm going to jump right into it if you're good to go. Sounds good to go. All right, awesome. So I saw you guys did, uh, or you, you did your first um, socially distant um, signing for Last Ronin. How'd that go? You know, it was it's 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 fun, but um, you know, I'll say what we're all feeling. It's just not the same. <laughs> no, um, we we one of the things that um, one of the greatest joys that Courtney and I have is is um, was traveling and, and tweeting out there and meeting the fans and going to not only all over the U.S. but you know, in, in some cases, in a lot of cases around the world. And I know you know we all understand, and we 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 miss being out there with you guys and. We all want you to be safe and and all that. So in the meantime, we just felt like we wanted to try to do as many things that we can um, keep in touch and, and 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 keep that spirit alive. So we've done, you know, over this past year, we've done, you know, watch TMNT with me, where we would sit and do commentary, audio commentary over the first movie and the second movie, and have these Facebook Live events where we can sort of interact and ask questions. So with the um, with the so the 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 arrival of the last Ronin, we thought it'd be fun to try to do something um, where we can, you know, cause it was been <laughs> seven months in the making and it didn't yeah. so secret. So we just thought uh, that kind of event might be a way we can address some of the questions and, and sort of reach out and, um, and, and be touch base with so many fans. So it was, it was a lot of fun, but again, it's like, um, man, there's nothing like being, you know, in a convention center in a convention hall, um, hanging out with the fans, and so yeah, we 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 miss everybody. Well, it seems kind of like a kind of like when the drive-in fixes. You know how comedians have been doing drive-in shows, or bands have been doing drive-in shows. It's a it's good to be doing something, but not still not right where it is. So that's that's awesome that it went well, yeah. and uh, that you guys are doing something. Yeah, thanks. Like the watch TMNT with me was really cool. I enjoyed that. Um, I had a couple questions kind of darting back to uh, the early early years. Um, so I grew up with the cartoon and the toys. And like as I got older and went through high school and learned about the history of how the comics came, it hit me at a particular time because at that time I started doing music. I'm a full-time musician and a music teacher. I teach pre-K to senior high at a charter school for kids with autism. Um, but it hit me at this Sweet. time where I was like, learning about the do-it-yourself mentality. And when I learned that that's kind of how you guys approached it, not kind of, that's exactly how you guys did it. You came up with this, your own idea and like did everything your own, but yourselves, it's like such a punk rock way to do it. What I had, a, my question is, um, who are some of those early uh, f people that installed that mentality or that we can do it type of thing um, to you and no, Peter a, at that time. A, no, that's such a great question, and it's and it hits right to the the independent spirit that um you know uh, you you find in uh, you know some of the early musicians and everybody sort of like you know um, um I say st I always use the term I said stand we stand on the shoulders of giants so if you know yeah. say if like you know you've got Elvis Presley recording little Richard songs or vice you know just you know, all the way up through to the old blues all the way up into the how that affected the British invasion and the rock and roll with the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and things and for us it was very similar that you know we grew up being originally inspired by you know um, my personal mentor was Jack Kirby but my second you know Jack Kirby Frank Miller and, and some of the mainstream guys but then uh, through Heavy Metal Magazine I discovered an artist named Richard Corbin and Richard Corbin led me to the world of underground publishers because Richard Corbin, before he was publishing heavy metal, was a self-publisher. Hmm. Um, so he could do what he wanted to, when he wanted to do, and he told exactly the kind of stories uh, that were written for himself and intended for an older audience. And so that was really pulled me into the world of underground comics where I then discovered um, you know, everything from you know, Robert Crumb to Zap to the Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers to yeah. you know, this whole black and white comics um you know, independent underground leading up to, um, in the mid seventies, uh, a guy named Dave Sim, um, who created a character called Cerebus started self-publishing. And that was kind of the first, 
middle ground comic book. It wasn't underground, which had, yeah. you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, um, as some of the early, late 60s, early 70s independents had. This was somewhere in between above ground, which you call Marvel and DC, and underground, which is below that. And it was something written for um, an older audience, but it had an, a certain edge to it. And that, to me, was like, that was like the big, huge light bulb going on, on over your head where you go, holy smokes, um, this is where I want to exist. This is the place where I want to tell stories. This is where I want to be. And um, and through the direct comic market, you could create and self-publish a comic book if you could link into the direct market who would distribute it to um, you know, a cross between head shops and comic stores. So when Peter and I grasped mm-hmm. onto that, we were following in the footsteps of, you know, Dave Sim. There was another really popular comic called um, uh, Elf Quest, which is Wendy and Richie Pini. And there was a, a few other uh, independent publishers emerging under the scene at that time. So we just kind of happened at the right space, the right time, at the right uh, opportunity to uh, self publish and, and reach an audience that might be receptive. So, uh, um, yeah, we were shit ass lucky, and <laughs> as well as you know, the timeliness was perfect. It was perfect. <laughs> what was it? It takes with like the whole do it yourself and like the underground route of all that. It's not like it's. I mean, I've I've read in I've heard a couple of interviews with you saying how it's kind of like lightning in a bottle, but that get to that point is a lot of work. It takes a lot of this mentality that a lot of people don't have, or they learn along the way of doing that. Um, when you guys are doing that, because that that that's a lot of work to put out your own book and push it yourself like that and try to develop a scene, you know, as opposed to just hop into one. And I've seen that a lot with like music, with like if you think of like how you said with the whole British invasion and like the grunge scene or whatever, there's like this movement and you're kind of doing your own thing and it finds a part in that. Um, but kind of going in that, I was there any like, uh, like, uh, how should I say? Is there any like other sources you can kind of link to that gave you the mentality to see through that and kind of power um, through all the the hard work to get to the point that the scene is going because it takes a lot of like mental. I we can do this. I got this. You know, and this is gonna work or maybe it won't. It's gonna be fun either way. No, it's that's it. It's like it, you know, you you almost um, answer your own question. I don't mean that. I'm not saying <laughs> no, that to be fine. sarcastic or anything. No. No, but no, but it's true. It's like the thing is, it's like uh, even though we were doing it, we didn't realize it because we, you know, you know, when we were younger, you know, I'm speaking for both you and I, um, and that you know, we didn't know what um, Elvis Presley went through. We don't know what the Sex Pistols yeah, went yeah. through. You know, uh, the Clash. You think of like every all you know, good You too. When you think of the early, you know, all good. You know, just you think of all these different bands. That the only thing that unified all of them was a was was passion and drive and it was like you know i just remember you know when i from a very young age of telling my parents like hey i want to want to you know i want to be jack kirby i want to draw comic books when i get older i'm going to do that for a living and they would just look at me with this absolutely mortified look and go <laughs> oh my god we're going to have one of those kids that never moves out of the basement um <laughs> yeah. and you can just imagine every you know actor actress me want to be musician yeah that had this dream to make it um you just go you know, you're against every odd. And the only thing that keeps you carrying on is the fact that, um, you know, you love it more than anything. And I've had, you know, people have asked me, they said, Hey, what would you be doing if the turtles weren't a success? Um, and I said, I'd still be drawing comic books. I, I would have found a way. I don't, the turtles were the greatest gift that I've ever, I, I just could never have imagined anything greater, but the turtles were, were it. That was, that was a pathway yeah. for me. Um, but if, if, if the f- first issue of the turtles was a complete failure, I, I would have not stopped drawing comic books because I tried and it failed. That was just a step along the way. It would have been a step along the way. Um, but in my case or for, you know, for Peter and I, that, um, there was something that was the right time, the right moment. It just clicked and it worked and holy shit. Then we just held on <laughs> for dear life. But the most important thing was, we were playing the clubs, we were playing the gigs, we were yeah. playing the stadiums, we, you know, it just kept growing and, um, we just followed the passion and, and, and kept true to, um, you know, what, what was working for us. And that was, that was it. It was, it was the passion and drive, you know, and I, you know, <laughs> it's a what? joke. I had a, a good friend of mine, Simon Bisley, who's a fantastic comic artist. And we used to joke like, 
if comics ever ceased to exist, what would we do? And we said, well, we both decided we'd be homeless. <laughs> um, but he said, like, you know what? We may be homeless, but we'll still be drawing comic books, wouldn't we? And I said, you damn right we would. We'd be pushing our shopping carts and <laughs> drawing so... comics. I don't know. It sounds so silly, but, uh, yeah, that was, no, it's the passion. The passion, the passion is is definitely that's amazing that's amazing like i am speaking of that issue you guys did um the body count was awesome side note um but one thing i wanted to ask i was flipping through some of the the older issues and i noticed um in this second issue of the first run of the turtles on the like third page or whatever it pans open and you can see everyone in the sewer and you can see the books on the shelf right and there's the tao of jeet kune do and so mm-hmm. there's this uh, Bruce Lee philosophy book. How big a role did Bruce Lee play in kind of like getting through this and developing who you are as far as an artist? In every Sorry. way, shape, and form. <laughs> oh, That's... no, no, no. No, you're spot on. It's like um, it was epic in every way. It was really... Um, 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 I was a huge fan of Bruce Lee from, from very early on, like we all were when we first saw him. And, and, and this guy just was like something we'd never seen before. He became immediately, immediately iconic. Um, and then of course, taking from us way too young. But when I first um, started to want to find out more about Bruce Lee and what he did and what made him the person he was, that's where, you know, the, the, you know, the, the philosophy of Ji Kwon Do which was, you know, just the idea that, um, and I still, you know, that's actually, it's going to be a, an important and big part of the last Ronin as people read the series and, and explore it, which is, you know, learn all martial arts and understand everything and appreciate everything and become the master of all things to be the ultimate martial artist kind of thing. And that philosophy, yeah. you know, is martial arts, which a lot of people misunderstand it as a, as an art form or a lifestyle because it's so, much about chi and balance and stuff that, you know, you can, it spreads throughout your entire life. It's not just, you know, you know, a way for self-defense or whatever. It's a, it's a big thing. And so it's sort of been something that's been uh, an important part of my philosophy. Not only, you know, I've taken martial, I, I did martial arts for 20 years and, oh, yeah? and um, um, but at the same time, um, yes, I, you know, and the same thing, it's like I've done Muay Thai and, uh, Kylie, uh, Aikido, wow. um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, Savat, which was one of my favorites. Um, but it was sort of a combination. I, I feel like yeah. Bruce Lee, the way he would sort of boxing slash kickboxing style was really, you know, it seemed like a combination of Savat and a few other things to, uh, Wushu. Just, you know, I appreciate and I love them all. Um, and now I'm just too old to do anything with them. <laughs> um, but, um, that's incredible. No, it's just, um, it's, it's a, it's a dedication and it's a, it's a, it's a, a philosophy that is important. And it's, um, it falls back down to, um, passion and understanding of passion and balancing the passion to pursue, um, you know, a life of, I guess, happiness in many, many ways, um, to, uh, just creating a balance in, in your life, which is very difficult. And now, more than ever it's um finding a happiness balance can be super challenging for sure was it i uh when i first started playing music my first guitar teacher because the guitar is my main he like he installed the bruce lee philosophy and like was like read this book and get into it and it was the Tao of jeet kune do and then i flipping back through some of these issues and i was like no way like the more i learn about you and how you how you came to be who you are is cooler and cooler so that's awesome. I um, also had a kind of a side note question on uh, you guys. Uh, the I think it's issue eighteen was dedicated to Bruce Lee, and um, mm-hmm. I don't think in any of like the repressings of stuff or the recollections of stuff that issue made it in there. Is there any particular reason? Um, basically, um, um, when I first met. Mark Bodie, who's the artist that um, we worked together um, on that issue 18, and we did yeah. that issue later on. Um, uh, he grew up in um, uh, Oakland, uh, Berkeley, you know, area, um, and um, 
you know, his father was a famous cartoonist and, you know, he, we both started out in the business around the same time. When we first met at, the, at a convention, he was a huge turtle fan. And he just said, he's like, you got, you're into Bruce Lee. And I said, you know, hell yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the G Quindo and this and that stuff. And he said, he said, do you ever want to do a, a crossover where we sort of did this homage to a classic Bruce Lee kind of story, you know, and it's, it follows the theme of, yeah, you know, following, going into, um, uh, uh, a town to visit an uncle who's being repressed by this local gang criminal gang yeah. and and you know bruce lee is the, the 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 typical you know warrior with no name the 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 savior with no name who then you know who stand always stands on the side of good and and things go the way they go and and so we worked on this thing and it was just like um we just had so much fun it was called shell of the dragon <laughs> yeah, but then, but in later issues um, and later um, uh, collections too, because you know after we sold the turtles, you know Nickelodeon owns it, and a lot of the the things that they felt that we did in that issue um, were racist. They felt that we were mm. we were not being respectful, and the thing was that we were sort of like we felt bad about that because we were paying homage to what we remember. Yeah. And what we saw in those Bruce Lee movies is still, whether you're talking about a spaghetti Western where you have, you know, um, Sergio Leone ripping off, you know, uh, Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo to do a spaghetti Western yeah, yeah. Um, to the philosophies of what was being done in movies at that time. It was still good versus evil. And it was told during a time period where, you know, we didn't see anything racist about it. And, you know, something that might be sort of a stereotype personality we felt bad that um, somebody might have read into it the wrong way, much like, you know, one of my favorite movies of all time is, um, of many movies, is, uh, is uh, Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah. And I felt like, um, you know, John Carpenter really tapped into this incredibly awesome and gifted group of filmmakers and actors and actresses and, and martial artists that were doing those kind of films and sort of brought it into mainstream view. And you look at like, you know, Big Trouble in Little China was one of the first things that took a serious approach to, you know, if you will, I can use the term loosely serious um, um, to those kind of films. But it was, uh, we didn't feel that um, it was offensive and we felt bad that people might have saw it as offensive, but Nickelodeon didn't want to want to see it imprinted. So, you know, reprinted any, any, in any way, shape and form. So, um, the last time I was put back in print was, um, I did a 25th anniversary book, um, that had it reprinted in full color and, uh, and stuff. So, gotcha. um, it, but you know, it's, it's a, as far as like a Bruce Lee tribute, like it hits all the things like you're saying with the story and just how, how it's all laid out and how the character looks and how the fights break out. Like, Going into it with that mentality, you're, I was just like, oh, this is sick. This is so cool. Like, Turtles and Bruce Lee, it can't get any better. But I guess um, <laughs> looking out of that perspective, it's probably, I don't know, that it, it's probably something to think about. Well, but. it's tough. It's like you imagine, like, you know, it's like when you look in, down in history, like, is, is uh, you know, I don't know, it's like probably apples and oranges, but when you look like a, you know, say like a war movie, like, yeah. I don't know, Saving Private Ryan, is you know, is that stereotype, is that, you know, are they stereotyping Germans, and, you know, is it a racial thing, is it this kind of thing, or, you know, it just, it's, it, I know that's a bit dramatic of a comparison, yeah. but I, I feel like, uh, you know, it's just sort of, uh, you know, there's there's got to be some opportunity to have the um intelligence and in, in the understanding of certain movies that were done, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago were done in a way that was reflective of that time. Yeah. And so you can't discount them. You can look at them, you can understand and you can grow from that, you know, learn and grow from them. But um, to basically you just call them out as, you know, something that's bad that should never be seen again then that's um, that's not a good thing. That's that's censorship, and I think that's even worse. Yeah, and you don't learn from it. And as a fan of both Turtles and Bruce Lee, I can tell that the issue was going for that. It wasn't going for anything that may have been uh, skewed a different way, but it was kind of a an uh, paying homage to that. Um, uh, to kind of take a turn from yep. that, 
Um, so the majority of people I talk to are musicians. Like I just talked to Joe Lally from Fugazi and it, I was kind of flipping through all the, the old runs and trying to get a gauge on musically where you're coming from. And, uh, I, I, I I'm going to guess talking heads. Cause there was the, I think it was issue 11. It was like, uh, the name of it was <laughs> true stories. Right. And that was that really cool issue where it's like a diary issue. Um, and I see a lot of references to Metallica throughout, um, the original Mirage run. But, um, what kind of music do you dig? Is there a certain music that you will draw to or write to or? You know, I was, I was incredibly lucky when I was young, um, is that, um, uh, my mom was, was, she liked both kinds of music, um, country and Western. Nice Blues um, Brothers which quote. Is a joke, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly where it was stolen. Great from. movie. Um, but then my dad, <laughs> oh my God, I, I like, I literally, um, I learned how to play harp, um, and I stress badly, but I would listen to all those early Blues Brothers records. Well, I'm back and forth when I'll be traveling back and forth to work, and I'd be, no uh, way. I, you know, A, C, D, E, yeah. G, and, F harp. I had a I had a whole harp belt, and I would just be playing along. Um, but that's where, you know. Um, but my dad was a big um, everything. He would listen to Mozart, to Almond Brothers, to Bob Dylan, to uh, you know, you know, Petey Wheatstraw. To like, he was just this just musicaholic, and so yeah. he introduced me to so many different bands. And so, like when um, you know, uh, as I you know, sort of got older and discovered things on my own. Like, um, you know, again, like, you know, um, the, the blues brothers, for example, suddenly you're like, you're chest deep in blues and, um, you know, uh, um, I'm just trying to think of blues brothers artists, but there was so many people that they John put Lee together Hooker, to um, create that band. Oh my Duck God. John Lee Hooker. And I was leaving. Uh-huh. Duck, you know, Steve, you know, Steve, Steve um, Copper. Uh, Duck Dunn and, uh, um, Steve mm-hmm. Cropper and Duck Dunn and, you know, Soul Man and, yeah. you know, um, you know, Flip Flop and Fly and just yeah, all yeah. that shit. It was like, just blew my mind. Um, so I'd listen to that kind of stuff, which then led me to sort of, I guess, my period, which was this kind of um, uh, smithereens, Bodines, gotcha. um, uh, um, um, the Cruzados to, um, you know, the Blasters to... Uh, nice. Um, the Del Fuego's local bands, Tree to Right, um, you know, just it was just anything and everything. I would always like, you know, I'd go into a, you know, when, when CDs certainly came out, um, you know, around that time, and I could, that was kind of my time zone. I would always buy, like, say, if I was in there looking for something specific, I would buy something new that I was looking for. I'd buy something old that I hadn't heard of, and then I'd buy something progressive that I also hadn't heard of, hmm. just to see. Yeah what I could find and, you know, it's like, you know, so that's when you, you know, you're watching, you know, Austin city limits and, you know, just flipping out over shit. You see, you know, you see Stevie Ray Vaughan up there, you know, doing, uh, you know, his shit on that and you go yeah. like just losing your mind. And then, there's nothing but, you know, also, him. you know, I was also, yeah. And obviously, uh, you know, earlier on was, you know, Pink Floyd was one of those bands that I just, I just lost it on. I was like the, you know, that's Still awesome. am, you know, that was uh, huge pain. So my, you know, the thing was people go like, what's what do you like to music? And I go, and I'm, I, I'm not kidding. I said, well, I like everything. And yeah. They go, well, you can't like everything. Um, try I said, me. I do, you know, and they go <laughs> like, well, yeah, try, try, <laughs> try me. So when you see references of like, you know, Metallica to whatever, you know, everything, you know, of course, the, you know, two stories to you know, so many different things. It is really. Uh, yeah. I think I saw uh, Robert a Gray poster. That, uh, in that issue somewhere posted totally. but that's all like the first thing i learned to play on guitar was the intro of the sweet home chicago from the blues brothers blues brothers movie and as a kid that, that yep. my dad was always into that and that's what i grew up on and like that's awesome that you played harmonica like uh do you still work on it lurking on the cross harp i do using the um, multiple <laughs> yeah you pull out my uh little walter or um yeah uh, something like that, put it on the background and then just, you know, just sort of sit in the garage while, you know, I'm doing, I was supposed to be doing other stuff and, and sort of hum along with that. But, uh, um, but yeah, that was, you know, it's like, cause the thing is, you know, I was, I still remember flicking through channels when we finally got cable, um, 
went in the eighties and finding discovering MTV. And that was like, what the is this shit? You know? Um, but, um, no, that's the, that's the, that's the thing. And that's always been, um, such a big influence because it really, it's amazing that, um, pop culture in general can follow a lot of the similar lines, whether it be music or, um, um, performing arts or movies or, or comic books, even there's a, there's a lot of crossover. I, I can't tell you how many comic book artists that I know that, um, you know, they're, they're all frustrated musicians. Um, when they're <laughs> not drawing comic books, they're playing guitar or playing bass or playing drums or something. Cause it's that sort of hits that right side of the brain. So that was the thing, trying to find a way to express yourself and learn different ways to do it. Apparently. Um, Another kind of shifting gear, because I know I'm losing time with you here. And um, so in the original Mirage run, I know I keep going back to that. There is an issue called Distractions, issue mm-hmm. 17. Sorry, what were you going to say? Yep. Um, no, no, a, yeah, go ahead. So yep. issue 17, which is, I believe, uh, it's called Distractions. And it's this, you start mm-hmm. off with this, uh, this one turtle and you figure out who it is. Is that kind of related to the last Ronin in a way? Not so well. I'd say not so much, only because when I did distractions, it was to because um, I had a good um, um, uh, one of the favorite one of my early favorite collaborators was Eric Talbert, and so yeah. um, he had a couple ideas to do. Um, a full story. He wanted to do a full issue on his own. And so, um, I just helped him beat out the story and beat out the, um, um, the concept of what he wanted to do and sort of directed him on that way. And so it was sort of a, almost like a twilight zoney sort of fantasy element kind of story. When you look at some of the alien influences and some of the other stuff that's sort of part of that, that thing. And that's around the time we were still exploring a lot of different ways we wanted to take, um, Tales of the Turtles, if you will, and explore gotcha. other ideas within the Turtle universe. But um, but Peter and I had already written, um, in 1987, we had written the outline of what would become, uh, would be, you know, revised and adapted into The Last Ronin. Um, and furthered by, you know, um, Tom and I, once we took the original source material, I did a couple um, lengthy and early revisions of how to adapt the story into something that would work in the capacity of what Tom and I were talking about was just kind of this, um, um, following in the footsteps of Frank Miller and the dark Knight, um, the dark Knight returns, which is sort of going back to all the earliest Batman roots and origins and ideas, but set in a universe that was out of quote unquote continuity of what was going on in all the other Batman universes that existed at, DC comics, um, or, you know, other forms of entertainment. So when we approached last Ronin, we approached it in a way that was, um, kind of dark Knight esque where it's not the Mirage universe, but it leans heavily on the Mirage universe. It's not the IDD, the IDW universe or any other turtle universes you've seen through, you know, comics and TV and, and cartoons. It's a universe within itself, but it still holds the same elements, you know, heart, soul, yeah. family, mutation um but it's firmly rooted in turtles issue one which is basically a, a revenge story yeah you know, splinter found these mutated animals and he mutated and raised them to kill the guy that killed his his master um and so we we sort of that's where the last ronin evolved is really from that concept because we wanted to complete that journey i tell the story of the completion of that journey however it's going to end up but also uh um you know, answer a lot of questions, at least for some of the original fans in a way that we think will be satisfying. And certainly I feel like selfish in that. I feel like uh, Tom and I are writing it for ourselves yeah. <laughs> because we are really having a great time at writing the story. Um, but it's also, um, we feel like it's something uh, that uh, um, so many of the original fans and some, even some of the new fans um, of the series will, will really find something interesting and unique with it so i think that's what's cool about i mean just most of the work you've done like a lot of flipping through all these old issues they're all kind of standalone stories that 
don't really or not I don't want to say they're in continuity of themselves but like they're all like these pieces like one's like a film noir piece and um, issue 17 is like this cool like play on feudal Japan and they all it's like 100% you guys writing it seems like stories that you would want to read and so it's cool that you're continuing <laughs> this in The Last Ronin and I think um, uh, comparing it to The Dark Knight I think you guys did a really cool job of paying homage to a Dark Knight esque story with the turtles as characters. Like when in the Dark Knight, when he's like talking to himself, and he's like, oh, can't run like I used to. Or, you know what I mean? Like how like the last Ronin is talking to his fellow um, brothers without spoiling it. Um, but I think that's such a cool like homage in like such a cool way that it plays um, plays with the characters that are in this separate universe with other characters within it from previous one, you know what I mean? No, that's, no, yeah, no, no, it's well, very well said. And, and that was sort of one of the things that we really wanted to explore. And you think about like, you know, if you're born and raised and trained, um, for vengeance and then, you know, you, you imagine then, cause we want the reader to assume that all things say, you know, you, um, Dave and just anybody else that's reading it have read a lot of other turtle stuff. So all yeah. the things that they've experienced, and then you sort of, here we are now, 20, 25 years later, and a lot of really tragic stuff has happened. Um, and it just messes with your mind. Not only that, you know, you, when you start really, when you're getting up there, <laughs> up there in age, and you're sort of reflecting on um, what you've done, where you started, what, what you've been through, and what you might have wanted your life to be, which might be, you know, I want to be a farmer. I want to live on a farm and raise sheep and just spend all my days sort of hanging out in the pasture and enjoying life and whatever. But you've gone through this. We all go through adversity and tough times and situations that we don't, we're reactionary. We're reacting to things that are put in front of us, shoved in front of us, um, stuff that we're forced to deal with. And so it can actually kind of fuck you up a little bit. Yeah. (laughs) And, uh, um, so, um, we want to, um, boil it back down to you to the point where, look, I started out this life to for a specific purpose and a specific mission, um, and with a, a family that is now no longer there. And I'm getting older, and I the last thing I'm going to do is make sure that mission is completed um, because you know my time is coming to an end, and if it's going to end, I'm going to end it the way I want it to end. And I want to complete this thing for family, for honor, for, you know, love and, and all that stuff. And so that was really everything boiled down into, uh, this specific idea. So it sort of, um, um, it's kind of, you know, I feel like when Tom and I laid out the issues, one, two, three, four, and five, you know, not only being longer issues, 40 pages each. So the double yeah. issues each time is my request was, major battle set i want huge set pieces action set pieces because it's important to the story not just to do them but it's yeah you need that intensity to 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 bring that that fully the idea fully to bear um but to um uh um i'm trying to sum it up in a way that doesn't sound too um i feel like (laughs) Each, each book will end in a way like if, where we ended issue one where the last word in issue one was revealing who the last Ronin was, Michelangelo. Yeah. You're going to find similar experiences in each of the issues. Each of the issues will take you to a further place in the story that um, we just want to blow your freaking minds in a good way, in yeah, a yeah. solid way. So it just, it, issue two, by the time people read the last page of issue two, they're going to be, what? <laughs> um, and then... Yeah, that's the good thing. writing. So it, that's and, good writing. I, it's, well, it's, and that's the thing, you know, it, it, it comes back down to uh, the one thing we touched on a few times during our chat is just the, it's the passion. And if you can't tell... I'm having the most fun ever, not only working with Tom Waltz, um, the Escorza brothers, uh, Isaac and Isa, who are drawing the stuff based on my layouts and designs. They're just kicking ass and taking names. We're bringing in my old buddy, 
Ben Bishop, who's specifically doing some key flashback scenes and some of the upcoming issues, starting in issue two. And I just think the fans, I, I just say, look, buckle up, you know, and, and hang tight because uh, we're going to take you on a ride that um, hopefully you'll dig as much as we're digging doing it. So, well, I think that's important. I think if you dig it and have all this passion to it, kind of like we said at the beginning, it's going to come through and everyone else is going to pick up on that. Just like with a performance, like when you see yep. Stevie Ray Vaughan play, you know that guy's playing. You can see it on his face and everything. It's all in there. They're going 100%. So I think just even with this first yep. one, it, I think it was a pretty just from a guy who goes to comic stores and can't find it. You know what I mean? Like, I think you guys knocked it out of the park. And I'm super excited for the next one. Thank you. Um, Thank you. You're, you're, I do think you're going to dig it and... I think the fans are going to dig it. It's um, it's something that's like uh, it's it's once in a lifetime kind of stuff that um, yeah, you know, it, it took you know because people. I mean, when I say that, I mean, well, I should I should probably rephrase it a bit. Only in that it, it could only have happened now. Yeah, there was a reason it didn't happen in 1987. But then, you know, after the Turtles resurgence and then working with Tom on 100 issues, um, ending in 2019 to the evolution of what the story became that it, it couldn't be the story it is right now at any time but now and that's that's kind of that that thing that you know creativity sort of you know it'll come to you when it comes to you and um <laughs> and sometimes it makes you feel like the loneliest person on earth but when, when it lands it lands hard and you better be ready to, to grab onto it and, and um, and go with it because it's uh, it feels good. Is it um? Do you, is it, it the availability of people now, or was it the this arduous adventure of writing a hundred plus issues with a team that led to the ability of this um, story to be able to come what it is now? It's it's a kind of a mixture of both in that um um you know you figure that. Uh, um, we've been working on the hundred issues for you know essentially ten years, yeah. um, but uh, it's just the the time and evolution from you know if you were a, a turtle fan in um, um, the heyday of the turtle, say the the early nineties, um, you know fast forward, you know say if you're ninety one um, to two thousand and one to two thousand and eleven to you know you now you know, 30 years old. And if you're still a turtle fan, there's an affiliation or relationship with your characters, much like we had growing up with, you know, I had growing up with Batman or, you know, Daredevil and other characters that were iconic to me. So I feel like it was the timeliness of, um, the comic book resurgence, the animated turtles resurgence, um, um, a number of the things that sort of hit this perfect, trifecta of this perfect storm of um the fan base is there and they're tuned in um i mean half the people that are standing in my line at a comic convention are 30 years old and older um so this story is going to hit them you know right where it hits me it's going to hit them in that, in that spot where you know they they discover the turtles as an animated turtle or toy turtle. And then they yeah. discovered the Mirage comics, um, the darker turtles and they still been a lifelong fan and they're still buying turtle toys. And then <laughs> oftentimes, you know, certainly in the conventions we've done over the last four or five years, it's been with, uh, families that have become turtle families because their kids then have discovered the 2012 turtle cartoon series and became fans. And so, um, uh, but yeah, just the, the timeliness was, um, you know, it, it works right now um, because we're hitting the right, the right um, attitude, tonality, um, and the fan base that is ready for, you know, this kind of story. It's much like, you know, when people ask me, they go, what would your, what would your next turtle, I guess, uh, expanded entertainment idea. What, where do you think the, the turtle should go in the future as far as movies or TV and whatever? Um, and I've said numerous times over the last couple of years, I said, if, 
if any of you people have grown up as fans of Daredevil like I have, when you see that Netflix Daredevil series and how incredibly awesome it was to the character in the Daredevil that I fell in love with, I said, that's where you need to do. You need to do a Turtles series, much like that Daredevil series, because that's your fan base now. Um, you're not having kids, quote unquote, so much watching Turtles cartoons and running into, you know, Target to buy turtle toys. It, they're watching it for the intensity of the story, good storytelling, good action, and most of all, almost where we started off this conversation is martial arts, yeah. and because it was inspired as a martial arts comic um, series. So um, I said that's that's where you need to go. You need to do a turtles a turtle series, much like Daredevil, and then uh, I think you have a home run. So they haven't listened to me so far, but <laughs> perhaps one day <laughs> that would be that would be rad. But, you know, with the same time. But, you know, at the same time, too, that um, even when we started the last Ronin, it's broken a lot of sales records for IDW and, and stuff. So I think Nickelodeon, in retrospect or in hindsight, has gone back and said, you know, you know, we see the kind of audience is, hit, is hitting again. It's, retro, you know, respectively small compared to what they, they shoot for for TV series and things like that. But at the same time, you know, selling almost 200,000 copies of the first issue is, um, it's not a, it's not a drop in the bucket. And it's something that they go, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you might be onto something here. Um, <laughs> what was the idea? <laughs> so let's, That's, in, <laughs> could you, could you read, read that to us again? It, uh, God. But there's something even like, even though if it's kind of an adult setting of a thing, like kids buy into that to some degree, like mm -hmm. as a, teacher i see so many kids rocking deadpool stuff where i'm like that's awesome but you're allowed to watch those yeah. movies you know what i mean <laughs> so like <laughs> there's something to the the earn like earnest and honesty to like an adult series i think it appeals to everybody and like in like yep. the daredevil and all the um netflix marvel's uh series being like keen of that like those took on a way more serious edge than like maybe some of the comic versions of it, but like, um, it, it, it definitely sold off. And like, there's a lot of kids as a teacher, I, I get to see it, which is really cool as I get to see this next generation into things. And I see, I see kids rocking turtle backpacks and coming in with like daredevil stuff and like Deadpool stuff, which is kind of out of nowhere and Pokemon stuff. And I'm like, I can relate to these kids. <laughs> I can have that random yeah. conversation. Yeah. But um, there's something about that serious thing, I think, that hits multiple um, demographics, I guess, age-wise. Yep, I do. I think there's, um, you know, because it is like, a, um, you know, the aging up of all of these audiences, you know, even if it is, you know, if you're talking video games or even music. Um, For sure. Not, you know, not even music, but, you know, music, video games, and, and movies and those kind of things, the kind of stuff that, um, you know, you know, our son is, uh, um, you know, just turned 14 and, um, you know, just sort of what he listens to, you know, uh, at his age, when I was growing up, you know, you'd, you'd get slapped if you were, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, just, it, it, the, the dynamic is so dramatically different and the acceptance level is different and the intensity of what they're exposed to. Um, it's funny you brought up Deadpool. I know he was, uh, when Deadpool first came out, we didn't allow him to watch it at home, but he was over at a friend's house yeah. and their mom let them watch it. And he came home and he goes, I watched Deadpool at Tommy's last <laughs> week. And that was kind of crazy. And we're going like, Arr. so, you know, Courtney, my, you know, Courtney, his mom called their mom and said, what the, uh, you, <laughs> can't, I can't believe you showed this R rated movie to our son. We, we, we wouldn't let him watch it. But, uh, um, but at the same time, it's like, you know, it didn't, you know, um, but it's, it is sort of a um, acceptance and, and the timeliness of of how we all grow up and, uh, and, and appreciate or, or discover that kind of stuff. And, you know, that's what makes, you know, you know, great bands, great bands. It's like, um, you know, when you discover a band and you claim them as your own because you discovered them, yeah. you're, you know, you're a lifelong fan. Um, you know, as long with a, you know, <laughs> millions of other people, but it's sort of like they can do no wrong and, and whatever, but it's, um, and they're speaking to you. It's weird. Like yeah. 
you're you're kind of when yeah. we were talking about music, you would how you're saying you'd pick up CDs you didn't know. Now it's not like that for kids. Everything's kind of like marketed to them, and the exposure yep. for kids is going to be way more, way vaster than like when you grew up or when I grew up, and we found things like, oh, who are these guys? Let me. I, I already made the commitment yep. to buy the the buy the disc, so now I gotta either like it a lot or hate it a lot. You know, like it's not just like next song, next song. It's in the, you're not. It's not marketed to you through an algorithm. Which I, I think maybe yep. develops that connection a little more uh, endearing, but to uh, to older music or music that you found that way. Um, but the kind of I know I've been um, taking. A, I really appreciate your time, Kevin. Um, as a kind of a last statement, as a teacher, I've been seeing these kids like uh, go for like certain things, right? So like. If you're joking around playing games or like they usually go for the character like that has the biggest like this guy's got the biggest gun, da da da, I want this character. But when it comes to choosing a turtle, they always go for the attributes of the character, right? They go for like the personality and like he's the leader or he's the fun guy, I want the orange or the blue. It's not like a physical attribute thing. It's like a personality trait. And I think turtles Yep it leads to kids beginning to appreciate and take steps for towards like self-actualization, right? Like I think like being able to identify with the smart guy or the leader as a kid with a character that they all look alike. And there's no, like I didn't go for the guy with the biggest arms or the, the cool neon green thing. It's just, I went for that guy cause he's the leader and eventually like, Oh, you know what? Maybe, Maybe that's why I went for that. Maybe because I'm a leader guy. Or you, I think what the characters that you guys came up with continues to lead kids down this way. And um, I'm super thankful for your time. And I really appreciate the conversation. No, I actually enjoyed the conversation very much. And just to, to respond to your last point, it's like, you're right. It's like, I think that like, because uh, um, when we picked the personalities of the turtles, they were inspired by many different things, not only, um, um, you know, say, you know, comic book that I was really fond of when I was younger was, a uh, of many comic books, but I liked the fantastic four. Yeah. I liked the fantastic four because they were kind of a family, but each one had an attribute to, you know, I'm a guy made of rock. I'm a guy made of flame and I'm kind of a hothead or, you know, it's, I'm the guy made of rock and it's clobbering time to I'm Reed Richards <laughs> and I'm the smart guy. Yeah. And just, so you had these things, but they would, they would bicker like a family. But when they came together to defeat a foe, it was when they came together that was they were the strongest. And so, you know that you could see it over and over again, not only in um, you know war movies to you know uh, the Avengers to you know just any, anything you'd imagine that the Beatles, you know, the, um, um, the Magnificent Seven, the Beatles. You're right, um, the Ramones. <laughs> you know, there's so many of these things, the Ramones. And so, when I feel like um, that was a commonality that um when we did the turtles and the turtles started coming together is that we wanted them to act like a family um and they have issues with each other but they have specific strengths that they bring to the table and even though they bicker the the end of the day you know when the chips are down they're a family and that they bond together they can overcome you know anything it's like whether you're talking the rebel alliance fighting the empire to you know you know on and on and on um last man standing kind of stories. Um, so, um, yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's, it's a commonality and it's Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey and, and all that stuff, but it's our version of that and, uh, what it means to us. And, you know, the fact that we wrote stories that we wanted to read and we found fans that would follow us. I think that's like how any band, you know, it's like, I, you know, I still remember watching, you know, I'm a total Beatles holic and yeah. it's like when you think of like you know what those guys accomplished in the time period they accomplished um for the songs that they wrote and did and the things that they they did was so it was worldwide and globally epic and it changed everything it was it, it, it readjusted and reset the playing field for everything and uh, um I'm not saying the turtles were that but it was <laughs> like we were a furtherance of you know, American superhero comics and what they would evolve into. We sort of 
picked up the torch and carried it, you know, 10 feet further down the field and everything else that's been built on top of it since then is just sort of, we're all part of the, the same, um, appreciation and the same, uh, you know, the same fan club. So, um, Ooh. but, uh, Hey, listen, um, I just want to say that <laughs> it was, uh, a thrill to talk to you. I appreciate it, Dave. And, um, likewise, it's likewise, a, fun. Kevin. It's a lot of interesting stuff. And, and, um, yeah, man. It's like, so look, we're going to be doing um, last running for the next, uh, oh, God, seven, eight, nine months. Yep. Um, at least the next seven, eight months. So if you want to circle back in you know, five months and, and chat again. I would love that. Uh, That'd be awesome. Let's do that. Let's see. You, you can give us, you'd be like a report card. You can let us know how we're doing. <laughs> It's it's uh, for me. It's I'm uh, I've been a lifelong fan. It's always going to be a knockout, and I really appreciate your time. This has been really awesome. Um, all right, man. Well, thanks for doing this. I I'll let you go. <laughs> my absolute pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your night, my friend. Thank you. You too. All right. All right. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Cowabunga. Cheers.